Now next is land use in watershed for flood risk reduction. Now we were just uh, discussing about that how you know different uh, measures that we can take for flood control. We discussed uh, uh, various approaches. Now land use also play an important role in uh, you know flood risk reduction. Now if you see in this figure, so this is your water area mainstream. Now ideally how the land use should be actually placed. Now immediately after this uh, mainstream water area, ideally we should have almost nothing here. This particular the first you know closest area to the uh, mainstream. Then next we can have pasture. Now this pasture will of course have dual role. It can also restrict the soil erosion. It can also reduce the speed of you know flood water intrusion towards the you know land area and also livestock uh, can also be grazed. After pasture we can have agriculture area and as well as you know playgrounds for community. Now this is the area where you also need to assure the supply of water and at the same time you should be also little bit sure about that frequent intrusion of water from the river or from sea line will not come inside the agricultural land. After agricultural land ideally we should have transportation, roads and finally your buildings starts, any kind of building, office, school and you can see that in below picture here. So what are the different kind of buildings and how it should be placed? Now commercial, first is commercial group, commercial type of building should be created in, in open space. Then we can have industrial buildings. I am talking about this type of building within this uh, particular land use for building which should be farthest from the mainstream. After industrial building we can have multi-story flood resistant building which could be building like flats for people to reside there. It could have office space also there. So multi-story building flood resistant building you can have next to the industrial building little bit more inside you can have single story flood resistant houses then you can have single story houses because this is now is bit far from the mainstream so the chances of flood water intrusion is relatively less finally you have critical utilities like hospital because we need to ensure that such critical facilities must be far away from the chances of any kind of flood water intrusion. So this is how you choose the land use and accordingly you place them to reduce any kind of risks that may occur from flood. Now early warning system EWS, early warning system is a very very important aspect for anything whether it is flood, drought, cyclone, anything any kind of natural calamity that you can think of early warning system is very critical you know for saving life and other resources. Now uses of advanced technologies, artificial intelligence, machine languages these are the advanced technologies which these days are being utilized for developing efficient early warning system. Now for flood how actually it it work. Now you have some sensor which starts from in a very basic steps. You have some sensor, rail phone sensor which can actually detect and can send the signal to the server which you have in cloud and also the database are created. Apart from rail phone sensor, you can have also water level sensor. Means this is the sensor. So if your water level rises beyond a certain limit, it will automatically send a signal into the server and that data will be stored there. From the server, the information will go to the main station where a person or a team of person will continuously monitoring that and then they will utilize those sensor 
through some modeling and then they will come up with early warning or prediction of an event. Now, this main station has actually all the kind of you know machines that you need and these machines actually you know largely regulated by several kind of microcontrollers and these microcontrollers will provide some kind of you know warning either through you know light system or through sound system. Now, the information which actually generated from the field through sensor. Now, this information straight away go to the server, come to the main station, processed here, the information goes to the systems, from the systems the you know message goes to some microcontrollers and then they translate it into either light early warning system or sound based early warning system. So, when it comes then this information goes to the people, to various stakeholders, state disaster management authorities, people who are involved with evacuation. So, they get alerted and then accordingly the actions is being taken. Now, here is another way that from the sensor as I said the information can directly go to the server, but the other part from both the sensor say rainfall sensor or, or water level sensor it can also go through sets of microcontrollers straight away to the warning system. So, this warning would be you know kind of what you call live early warning or live warning system or you can say real time, real time warning. Okay. So, as soon as there is a rainfall and that the water level goes beyond the you know safety level immediately through some sets of microcontrollers it goes to the warning system light or siren. So, that would be your kind of real time warning the other path I have already explained which actually comes in the form of early warning utilizing some modeling system or use of a ML. Now, how to actually suppose you get uh, the kind of information or warning or you know that that could be flood situation, how actually you can moderate that kind of situation in a watershed that is very important. Now, minimization of flood damages by moderating the flow of flood is one aspect of flood moderation in watershed and these moderation of flood in a watershed largely done by temporary retaining of flood water and through safe and controlled release towards the downstream. So, these are the two main uh, moderation ways that are being used for flood moderation in any watershed. How actually this process takes place? Suppose you have a situation of flood, now how actually the process of moderation will start? So, in watershed level you will have some data as I just mentioned in the previous slide, it could have an in the cloud or it could have in the server or in different manner. Now, watershed has certain information about slope, elevation, drainage, land use, hydraulic characteristics etcetera. Then you have reservoir in that area, you have also information about the reservoir storage capacity current water level, outflow capacity, hydro power generation capacity. You also have with you the climate data which talks about precipitation, wind etcetera. Then you have socio-economic data where actually you have the information about the water demand, the livelihood vulnerability, the project management system, operating cost, power generation all this information you have under socio-economic data. Now, once you have these all data or information with you, then you actually using this rainfall and runoff data you go for simulation models, flood routing, you use AIML and different kind of time series models applications to come up with some kind of anticipatory solutions. Now, reservoir simulation using single or multi objective linear or non-linear optimization techniques also are there. 
but they depend on your purpose. There are various options. So, which one to go for actually will be decided the purpose for which you are going to use that. Now, once you analyze all these, all these uh, uh, data that you have and through this you run some model, come out with some kind of uh, decision support system, then you get the reserve operation strategy decision in the process on the basis of this database which you have with you and through certain you know advanced analysis of those data. Finally, you come up with a strategy. One can call it as decision support system DSS. Now, what actually at this stage you know the strategy or decision making stage what actually are involved in that particular process. Minimization of damage of downstream for rural livelihood because from upstream when you see the water level goes beyond uh, safety limit certainly you have to decide to allow some water to go uh, to the downstream. But that amount of water which you are going to you know allow to pass towards the downstream also depend on that the li livelihood, the agricultural areas and other aspect which are actually located there in the downstream. So, you have to consider the impact of releasing the water towards downstream beforehand. So, minimization of damage of downstream in the rural livelihood can also be decided through this kind of exercise which I just expressed. Then inundation protection in downstream and urban areas, often it happens that it is not because of the rainfall that the downstream area is getting inundated or flooded, but it gets because the water has been released from you know some uh, dam or, or some place where uh, you have a reservoir. So, that decision has to be you know taken considering upstream as well as downstream condition. Dam structural health protection is also another aspect which actually taken care of in this process when you make the decision. So, coming back to this that the entire flood moderation system which is very, very important for any watershed, we start doing it with the help of the data that we already have and these data will actually go into different kind of modeling systems and then they will analyze that. That information will go ultimately through some uh, optimization exercises to be sure that yes, what you are going to give the decision is uh, almost error free because any decision taken there could affect either upstream or downstream people, infrastructure, resources. So, these are the aspects that we should keep in mind. I earlier talked about water harvesting issues. I also discussed about roof water harvesting and why it is important even in area where a good amount of rainfall takes place. Those things I have uh, discussed. Now, few point I just thought of you know uh, sharing with you is that water harvesting is good, we know that. But there are certain constraints that the practitioners or administrators or community when they go on the field to do it, they may face this constraint and they are like rainfall. So, it largely depends on the amount and frequency of the rainfall. So, water harvesting generally is not much suitable in an area with much lesser rainfall or drought condition, we know that. Second, low storage capacity tanks or structures, they are not economically suitable for water harvesting, all right. Third, leakage issue. If you have leakage issue, then your entire effort, investment, energy for having water harvesting could be a failure. Water pollution, another aspect you have suppose successfully done the water harvesting, stored it, but the water that you have stored, if it is already contaminated, then it is of no use. So, it is important to see the water pollution level and surrounding agricultural, domestic and other you know, waste nearby to that area. Treatment is necessary for proper use of the water that you have harvested. Sometimes storage tank in village areas could be unsafe for children. I am talking this about 
you know our indian condition system in the in the rural area because still there are lot of cases reported that you know small kids they often fall down in in some kind of deep hole or or some kind of structure which are kept for some other purposes so this is again one very practical issue or constraint then often uh, you might face it in case of water harvesting this can also act as a breeding places for mosquitoes and other insects these days when you have you know various kind of like dengue etc so clear water is also we know that is a uh, very suitable breeding place for dengue mosquitoes so these are few very practical constraints or challenges that uh, we have in our hand that we need to take care of while we go for water harvesting now in case of uh, water harvesting you will find that at the uh, rural level or at the village community level one of the most common water harvesting structure that you can see is uh, percolation tanks or in some cases people call percolation pond now this is basically artificially you know created surface water body which is highly permeable and this should actually allow the water to percolate down below so that it can recharge the ground water that's the main purpose of percolation pond now this percolation pond they are not provided with uh, sluices or specific kind of outlets for discharge of the water however this percolation tank sometime could have some kind of arrangements for the removal of the excess you know surplus water to avoid just you know over topping you remember that that we have discussed about you know toppling down of system in case of kind of uh, flood uh, situation so this is what actually as talking about that over topping can also takes place in what turning can also takes place so this we have to also keep in in mind now tanks uh, or ponds percolation tanks or percolation ponds normally constructed on second or third water streams why because the catchment is generally small okay so also the submergence area would be smaller relatively smaller the soil needs to be highly percolating in nature because whatever water which is stored in the percolation pond has to go down has to percolate so that it can basically recharge the ground water because that's the major purpose of having the percolation pond for water harvesting tanks or these ponds should be located on a highly fractured and weathered rock again for speedy recharge of the aquifer which is mostly you know get recharge through this percolating water so the benefited area the surrounding area of this percolation pond should contain wells and cultivable lands for utilization of this recharge water so if you have a percolation pond here ideally you should have kind of a well recharge well here in these areas and of course this uh, percolation pond should be surrounded by agricultural land because that these areas uh, ground water is supposed to be already recharged by uh, the presence of this percolation pond so the pond water height in general are somewhere on between 3 to 4.5 meter above the bed level that's an ideal kind of height for such kind of percolation pond so this is a very simple uh, water harvesting structures but has you know very good effect on recharging ground water so how actually it works percolation tanks so as you see that this is the picture it can explain you about the technicalities of percolation tank so this is the this is the water body the tank you have you can have a small bond here in case this uh, water level rises and should not go there but even if at a some time because of excess rainfall if the water cross this bond it can come inside this well and again it can recharge the ground water obviously this percolation tank which is already you have created 
they will directly recharge your ground water as you see these arrows. So, they will already going to recharge and in case of excess water as I said they can if they pass the bond they will go inside the well and again they will recharge the ground water. Again as I said that these areas largely should be pervious layer means water should be allowed to percolate so that it can recharge your this ground water all right. So, in case of uh, tanks bonds are generally made of earthen dams are generally three types which actually we see in uh, conditions like India and Indian subcontinent. Type A which is homogeneous embankment type we have discussed about embankment earlier. Type B zoned embankment type and the third type type C is diaphragm type. So, these are the three types of earthen dams that we normally see in case of percolation tanks like structure for water harvesting. Among these three you will find that type A are the most commonly used earthen dam which is normally created by excavating this, this particular while you actually creating this percolation pond. This soil actually you deposit here and you create a uh, earthen kind of dam or bund. So, even the soil which is comes out of these uh, excavations are used for making the earthen you know bund or dam. So, this is uh, in brief is the percolation tank you know inside detail. The second types of you know water harvesting structure at the community level comes recharge pits. Now, recharge pits are made through excavations which are deep enough to penetrate even the low permeable layers overlying the unconfined aquifers. So, before the aquifers even if you have a uh, low permeable layer this recharge pits will allow you to take that water even into aquifer crossing this you know semi permeable or less permeable layers. And these recharge pits are ideal sites which actually you know influence those streams which you are actually having in and around that particular area. Alluvial soils or alluvial areas having lot of these days uh, you will find brick cleans, uh, abandoned quarry pits and various kind of things uh, mostly in the alluvial areas. The reason is that that soil um, is very very good for having this kind of small industry, but we all know that these are the things which uh, these days coming in fact in between agricultural land. So, that creates a lot of uh, problem with not only with uh, polluting the soil, but also the surrounding water bodies. Now, how actually uh, we have created this kind of research pits? Now, you see that this is the stream you have any stream inside an area and then these are the ground surface you have plants clay soil suppose in the both side then water goes down below the water table. Now, come here this picture which will actually clearly explain how this thing is happening in case of research pits. Now, we have suppose high permeable material here because I said that this is important for ground water to be recharged. So, water comes through and straight away goes to the water table and uh, then you have impervious layer and this water table slowly it goes up and utilizing this recharge water table you can have your cropping system agriculture or other activity utilizing you know this water. So, next comes uh, the recharge saps. Now, recharge saps as you see in this picture is a little uh, different than the previous two. Here again we have the water body or the stream here. Here you allow through some channels the water to go into the water table directly. And here you can have in between also the high permeable material here and low permeable material here. So, to bypass this low permeable material you use this kind of you know channel to allow the water straight away go into the uh, water table. It actually is cost effective and also efficient for 
groundwater recharge purposes. Normally, these uh, recharge shafts are used for unconfined aquifers that are overlaid by low permeable layers. As you see here, shaft diameter, this is the shaft, the shaft diameter varies between 0.5 to 3 meter and depth 10 to 15 meter. Okay. So, depth can vary along with the water availability. So, your amount of water available there on the stream will decide the depth of your shaft. Now, the surplus water which is stored in the tank can be used also for various domestic purposes and groundwater research as you see here in this picture. The top of the shaft is kept above the tank bed level, preferably say around half of the full supply level. So, that is where you will keep your you know top of the shaft. So, shafts are again uh, backfilled with gravels, with gravels, pebbles, boulders, core sands and the top 1 to 2 meter is normally brick machinery works uh, might be done for uh, stability of the uh, shaft just to give little bit more stability. So, this is the way the reach up shafts are being uh, constructed and utilized for water harvesting purposes. Next comes abundant wells. Now, these are very common in our Indian villages and rural areas. You will find this kind of abundance uh, wells many places across our uh, rural areas and villages. Found in both in case of hard rocky area and also alluvial regions. These can be dug or bore as uh, tube wells we have also in the villages. So, same kind of thing that can be used as you know wells for water recharging. This can also be used as uh, groundwater recharge which you have here in this picture. But one important aspect is that with these abundant wells the regular monitoring is required. Otherwise, what will happen that uh, these abundant wells can have siltation, it also can have choking of the pipes. Most importantly, the water quality may get deteriorate. Pollutions can also impact this water because as I said that if your water whatever you have harvested after a lot of effort and energy and resources, if you find those waters are polluted in nature, the entire uh, effort of yours goes actually uh, totally what you call waste for that purpose. So, regular monitoring is a very, very important for this purpose. All right. So, we can have you know uh, various uh, kind of situation for this kind of abundant well and this abundant well uh, sometime what happens is that uh, if you have the uh, stream and the water nearby the source of water nearby then you can have some delivery pipes from the water stream in it can pass through core stand and gravel and pebble and then finally can go into the well. So, this is the way a kind of small filtering of the water that has been harvested can takes place and you can avoid the chances of contamination of harvested water. Modification of a village tanks and on farm water management. These are again very common in, in our Indian condition. This modification of village tanks on farm water management normally carried out through lining of pond, uh, desilting of pond, then tank and farm ponds which percolation ponds which are actually used for groundwater recharges. So, what happened is that this picture uh, will explain you in detail about this uh, type of uh, water harvesting structures. Suppose in an area you have a pond area where you have water, rain water also gets stored. You can actually grow certain kind of plant species which love flooding condition like the rice. Okay? So, apart from growing the crops in that flooded area, so that water which is stored in the pond area you can protect them through some dike system. Also, you can have you know some piping system from this water body take the water into a seepage or percolation pond. 
Now, once this water comes here, you can actually use it for aquatic lives, fish and etcetera some other uses. So, this percolation once it comes into percolation pond, then you know that it is going to recharge your ground water both way it can go vertically down and also horizontally on both side. So, what happens is that uh, this on farm management of water harvesting is very very sustainable in nature and it could be very useful for overall development of the water resources in any rural area. The reason is that in one hand you are able to get a crop which can withstand flood water or flooded condition. On the other side you are also having your ground water recharge. So, this kind of situation can be created very easily in any Indian rural area or villages and sometime you will find that uh, you know some of the small ponds or tanks are often having kind of uh, vegetation cover or aquatic life. So, you can have actually livelihood also from utilizing that the water the rain water which is stored in the pond or in the percolation pond. So, overall this can be a kind of a win win situation in one hand you store you harvest the rain water on the other hand you generate income utilizing the uh, water that is stored apart from recharging your ground water for you know future agricultural practices irrigation. So, this is how you see that uh, different water harvesting structures it actually helps. Pond lining is also important in case of uh, water harvesting structures in rural area. So, the lining of pond is critical to avoid you know the, the erosion of the soil and also you allow the water to get stored in that particular pond for a longer time. Now, it stops or reduce the uh, seepage of water the pond lining. It also prevent uh, salinity of the surface water by preventing you know some upward intrusion of soils in the stored water that you have created uh, in the area. It also saves ground water and wastage of water. Excessive water evapotranspiration can also be regulated to some extent. It enriches the water availability into ponds for a longer period of time. Normally, this water can be used for irrigation more efficiently if your uh, ponds are you know having linings. Highly useful in case of porous soil where water retention in ponds become a challenge. So, if you have pond lining then you can actually allow the water to stay there in the pond otherwise it will pass very quickly uh, from the storage tank. It prevents as I said soil erosion. Lining material we use different kind of lining materials polyethylene in flame, brie, concrete, clay, bentonite clay etcetera. I will show in the next slides couple of example of those. Polyethylene lining this is you know this looks like this, but if you ask me I would uh, I would not go for polyethylene lining as the very first preference. Neither I would go for concrete lining again as the first preference. So, uh, what I will prefer at the village level is that clay lining for obvious reasons and then you can go also for uh, brick lining. But if you need you know little larger amount of water storage and if you need for you know larger uses of irrigation or covering the a larger area of agricultural practices then you need concrete and polyethylene type of lining because of course, they are can actually allow the water to get stored for much longer time. But clay lining and brick lining these two are the cheaper option and also sustainable in many ways. These days uh, there are many kind of new materials are coming also using for water harvesting structures. Geotextile, geosynthetics these are some of the things which are coming you know increasingly in case of uh, water harvesting structures. Anicat we are already using in many cases uh, in southern part and, and also in the western part you will see lot of uh, anicates. These are basically small water harvesting machinery dam which are 
normally constructed across a stream and uh, the water is largely used for irrigation and also for drinking purposes. In Rajasthan especially if you, if you have been there, you will see that you know hundreds of years back the ruler of Rajasthan's, uh, the kings, they actually used to have a kind of uh, water storage structures which they call bauli. Now this is amazing to see that even hundreds of years back they had such kind of technology knowledge with them. These baulis actually could store water almost the entire dry season. So, they could actually utilize this water for many, many months when the outside weather is very harsh, uh, completely dry, but baulis will have water there, which is stored from the you know very little that uh, window of rain that they used to get. Baulis are kind of you know stepped wells for water harvesting. Uh, so, they make it stepwise as you see in this picture. So, some of the water harvesting structures in the northern part of India often you will see they call it tanka. So, these are traditional again rain water harvesting you know techniques largely used in uh, Rajasthan and sometime in UP areas. This is basically cylindrical paved underground pit for you know harvesting. Uh, roof water, rain water or runoff water which comes in and then you can this they can pass through this and then they go inside and stored in the tank. So, this uh, kind of structure we call as tanka.